Meinhard v. Salmon is a famous business law opinion written by Judge Cardozo, who later became a Supreme Court Justice. The case was decided in 1928, a year before the stock market crash that marked the beginning of the Great Depression. What happened in this case? This case involves a 20-year lease for the Hotel Bristol, which was located in New York on Fifth Avenue by Central Park. Two men, Morton H. Meinhardt and Walter J. Salmon, went into a joint venture in which Meinhardt invested some $200,000 to add some shops and offices to the Hotel Bristol. Meinhardt supplied the capital and Salmon supplied the labor by managing the property. The profits and losses were to be shared equally. When the lease was ending, the landlord of the property, Elbridge T. Gary, who had actually inherited the property from his mother, Louise M. Gary, did not want to continue the lease. In fact, the Garys owned and wanted to renovate that entire city block. Gary went to the hotel where he met with Salmon, who was on site in his function as the property manager. Gary offered to Salmon a lease for the entire block. It's not clear whether Elbridge Gary actually knew Meinhard was involved in the joint venture, since it was his mother who had negotiated and come to terms with Meinhard and Salmon, but surely Salmon knew that he was involved with Meinhard in this opportunity. But without sharing the opportunity to rent the entire block with Meinhard, and without offering to include him, Salmon accepts Gary's offer and enters into a private deal between Salmon and Gary upon the expiration of the 20-year lease. Meinhard finds up and gets upset because he wanted to be involved in the deal. Meinhard sues Salmon for stealing or usurping this opportunity. Meinhard argues Salmon did not have the legal right to take this opportunity for himself because the two men were partners in a joint venture. Salmon, on the other hand, argues that his responsibilities ended when the joint venture ended, and the joint venture ended when the lease ended. So, who's right? What does the law, or in this case, what does Justice Cardozo say about this dispute? And by the way, there is a vigorous dissent in this case. So, there were arguments that were strong on both sides. We have some colorful language from Cardozo in this famous opinion about this case. First, Cardo Cardozo refers to these men as co-adventurers and he finds they have a duty to each other, akin to the duties partners would have for each other. Cardozo describes this duty between partners as a duty of finest loyalty, and Cardozo asserts that courts have enforced this duty of finest loyalty with uncompromising rigidity. That is a significant assertion, but later we'll see that assertion might be a bit overstated. We will see that modern corporate law does not have such an uncompromising standard. But let's not get too far from the case law right now. Let's get back to what Cardozo wrote. Justice Cardozo not only asserted that the two men were co-adventurers who owed a duty of finest loyalty to each other, but also that one man owed more duties than the other. Which of these two men should have the greater share of responsibility to the other? Think about their roles. On the one hand, we have a person who invests money, and on the other hand is a person whose labors are hoped to make that investment mutually profitable. Who should bear the greater burden of the duty of loyalty? Cardozo argues that Salmon should have the heavier burden. Salmon, the manager, owes a greater duty of loyalty to Meinhard, the investor. Why should a manager have a higher obligation to the investor than the investor to the manager? Think about this for a minute. If Salmon is doing all the work, maybe we could think of it as going the other way. It is tempting to say that since Salmon is doing all the work, shouldn't he get all the benefit from the work? Why should the labor have any responsibilities to the capital other than doing the work? To 
answer this question, we need to think about economic incentives. In other words, we need to use economic analysis to understand how investors and managers will behave given a particular legal rule or system. Put yourself in the position of the investor. You have money that you want to invest. What legal rule will encourage you to invest your money in the efforts of another person? In other words, are you more likely to feel willing to invest your money in the efforts of a manager who has a duty of loyalty toward you? Or are you more likely to invest in a manager who has no legal obligations to you? When you think of it this way, it's clear that a rule which puts a duty of loyalty in managers encourages investment in the efforts of others. If a manager could freely steal or usurp from an investor, who would become such an investor? So we see in this case Cardozo's economic instinct that the law must impute some duty of loyalty upon the manager such that the manager cannot steal or usurp from the investor or from the partnership. Otherwise, we will not have investment and investment is the basis of capitalism, which is our economic structure. There is at least one more reason why Salmon should, as a legal default, owe duties to Meinhard. Again, I will invoke economic concepts. The concept here is information asymmetry, or information asymmetric information. Information asymmetry means one party or the other has more information, or that one party or the other can get information more cheaply than the other. In other words, Information asymmetry exists when one party has an information advantage over the other party. Who has the information advantage in this case? Who knows more about the opportunities and challenges at the Hotel Bristol? Is it the investor who contributes money from afar? Or is it the manager who is running the hotel on a day-to-day -day basis? Who has the better information about the hotel? In most cases, the manager will have more information about what's going on than the investor. In fact, isn't it the manager's job to know what's going on with the business? When you think of it this way, it might become clear that the manager generally has an information advantage. In this case, and in the usual case, there's an information asymmetry in favor of the manager, in favor here of Salmon. For this reason, Meinhardt might expect Salmon to be forthcoming about what he learns through his role as manager. And the law might want to correct for this asymmetric information problem. At least that's what Cardozo seems to think. There is, however, a vigorous dissent in this case. So that indicates there were strong arguments on both sides. In the dissent, Judge Andrews seems to believe otherwise, because this was just a limited joint venture. The parties could have formed a corporation. They could have made a formal and indefinite partnership. However, they did not elect those formalities. They chose to make only a joint venture. Andrews argues that this implies the parties did not intend to owe duties of finest loyalty to each other. Each man wanted to stay free to pursue other business opportunities. Cardozo seems bent on applying this high standard to this relatively basic form of corporate endeavor. He says that the manager owes to the investor a duty not of honesty alone, but a punctilio of honor the most sensitive. A punctilio of honor the most sensitive is the standard of behavior, according to Cardozo. Powerful words. Poetic words. Unfortunately, they're not true. That is not the law today. The law today is surely closer to Andrew's position than Cardozo's. By the way, ultimately the result of the case was that Meinhard won. Cardozo, speaking for the court, concluded that Salmon breached his duty of loyalty to Meinhard by usurping this business opportunity that properly belonged to the joint venture. 
The remedy for this is the court formed a constructive trust in which Meinhard got 50-50 share in the upcoming project. Meinhard became a joint owner of the new lease for the entire block. And for this reason, you might think Meinhard was delighted. After all, he won. He got the result he wanted. He got half of the business. But in an ironic twist, it was actually Salmon who really won the business case. That new business turned out to be a flop. The project was not profitable. It was a huge loss. And being a part owner, Meinhard had to bear half of the losses. It's for this reason, apparently, that every year on the anniversary of the day on which this case was decided, Salmon, the loser, would send a beautiful bouquet of flowers to Justice Cardozo, thanking him for his opinion. And that is the story of Meinhard vs. Salmon.